Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to the channel, if it's your first time here. Uh, today's topic is all about real estate photography expectations. So I've given a lot of thought to this recently after having a comment suggesting that we cover this topic. I thought it was a great idea. Uh, so here we go. And we will start with the expectations that you should have of the property itself. So the context in which this topic was suggested in the comments was that the uh, commenter is a real estate photographer who seems to have trouble with properties not being ready to shoot when he arrives. And yeah, I, I feel that, I live that, <laughs> right? So for me, it seems to be the same agents over and over that this happens with. Um, I mean, the fact of it is not all agents are equal and some of them are quite lazy. And there are other agents who just aren't confident or assertive enough with their clients to advise or instruct them to put the work in that's needed to prep the home to be photographed. Either way, it makes more work for us. The good agents do make sure that everything is buttoned up and ready to shoot. The people are clear, etc. The lazy agents, not so much. I have a couple clients, real estate agents, uh, who I've never actually met, even though I shoot their listings from time to time. Unfortunately, I haven't found a way to really enforce that a property be ready to shoot when we arrive. So I've tried sending out property preparation checklists with things like move the trash cans, move the cars, pick up the, the toilet tools out of the bathroom and, and such. Didn't seem to help. I've considered and even did for a short time, giving a vacant and staged discount, but ultimately realized that the agents weren't behaving any differently than each of them typically do. So the good agents were still good and the bad agents uh, were still bad, uh, but I was just making less money. So I scrapped that one pretty quickly. What I haven't tried is penalizing by way of a surcharge jobs where nothing is ready to go. I think that might actually work but I also understand that that's not a solution for everyone. So by that, I mean, it's, it's gonna work, it's better, it works better if you have clients to lose because you may lose clients with that strategy as you could anytime you raise pricing for any reason. It's important to keep in mind though, that any clients you do lose if you did something like that are the ones that you probably could have done without anyway because I don't believe the clients that you've built a great relationship with are gonna be turned off by something like that. Those are usually the ones that it's not affecting anyway because they're, you know, they're, their homes are, uh, are buttoned up by the time you get there. So having said all that, you have to be sensitive to there being situations where the property just cannot be prepped as well as other properties are. So for instance, just recently, I shot a condominium where it was an older couple and the man of the home was on oxygen and the guy can't move more than like a few feet in any direction without being winded. So that property wasn't all buttoned up ready to shoot. Um, and you know, you don't want to penalize the, the agent for something that their clients physically have trouble doing. So just be sensitive to people's situation and understand that there are many reasons a property might not be prepped. So let's move on to expectations the client has of you, the photographer. It goes without saying that you should be punctual. I like to arrive a few minutes early, typically, so I can find a good place to park. Um, that's going to be, you know, problematic in some areas of the country and not so much in others. Um, but, you know, sometimes the vehicle is going to get in the way of the shot, and so in that instance, I just park wherever is, is best, uh, you know, most convenient for me. And then I'll move around the van and, and keep those shots till the end, uh, you know, move it around as needed. So it, it's, it's also obvious that uh, you should be clean, um, <laughs> or at least present yourself uh, being clean. And you know, I know I have a beard, you know, and that's fine, you know, because this is a this is a creative field, beards are okay, Mohawks are okay you know, things like that. Um, you know, showing up to a shoot in uh, a wife beater full of holes and smelling like weed, you know, that's that's not okay. So, you know, you, you gotta be professional. So, um, dovetailing on being professional. Uh, here are some other tips that 
may or may not fall under expectations, but they make you look good to your client. So efficiency is number one here. So I actually plan to make a video on how long you should be on site for a real estate shoot, but without spoiling that video or getting too deep into it here, know that time on site is a balancing act between quality and speed. So the good news there is that you're the slowest when you're new at this. And I promise you that once you have some experience doing it regularly, you'll find those little things that help both your quality and your speed. So you'll get a lot faster and your photography will get better as you get faster. For obvious reasons though, the less time you're on site, the better. That is for everybody involved, you, the agent, the seller, other tradesmen that are working around the home. And that happens, you know, as these places are getting prepped for sale, uh, you will find other tradesmen working, you'll find pest inspectors coming by, uh, you might find home inspectors coming by. So, you know, just plan to be flexible with that, you know. Um, it's tough when there are other people around, I get it. So, um, speaking of the seller, there are a couple things that I always like to do if possible. And the first one is to acknowledge your client, their agent to them. You know, I tell you, you made a great decision hiring John to sell your home. He's a fantastic agent. You know, stuff like that gets back to the agent. And if they know you're reinforcing their relationships with their clients, it's you they're going to keep calling. The other thing I like to do is ask the seller if there's anything in the home that they do not, or that they do or do not want photographed. And I'll use the examples of safes and or significant art as the don't photograph things. Um, safes especially. Uh, I, I come across gun safes in closets frequently. Sometimes you wouldn't have photographed that closet anyway, so it doesn't matter, but sometimes you need to figure it out. So for instance, perhaps you're not shooting stills or video of that closet, but maybe your client is expecting a Matterport tour along with a 2D floor plan. The Matterport camera is going to see it. And so, you know, you can cover it with a sheet and that's what I do in those cases. Most often, uh, I've actually helped move a safe once that was in the living room right in the middle of a big wall, so there's no way to shoot around it and not shoot the living room. Um, and it, it was, this particular house, it was a featured room of the home, so you got to get it. And, um, you know, so we had to move it out and then move it back. I don't like doing that, but, you know, I'll do it. And uh, I mentioned significant art. So this not might be, this might not be, as prevalent or, or an issue everywhere, but within my area of coverage are pockets of quite wealthy people and sellers. And honestly, I don't think I've ever shot a multi-million dollar home without some kind of art in it. It just, it's something that you see with, with wealthy people. Uh, so why do I ask about those things? Uh, as I explained to the sellers, these images get disseminated broadly along with the address of the property. So most MLS systems in the country are set up to automatically push information to Zillow, Trulia, all, all those ones. And I would hate for my photographs to be involuntarily implicated in someone getting robbed, right? And by the way, this, this gets back to the agent too, uh, that you're looking out for their clients. So all this makes you look good too. You know, it's, it's good practice to do these things anyway, but it also makes you look good. So, Finally, there's the expectation of delivery time for the images. Now, I have a bone to pick with whoever standardized the 24-hour delivery thing, because, you know, because we're, we all struggle with that, right? Uh, but that's pretty much the standard in our industry is 24-hour delivery for stills. It's always good to ask the agent, though, and I always do, uh, you know, when do you plan to list it? Because sometimes they say, oh, you know, it has, we have this to do and that to do, and so... You know, you've got a few days or, or whatnot. Um, so ask anyway. So that about wraps up the, uh, the expectations of the agent, the home, and, uh, and, and the, uh, the photographer. I uh, could probably think of a few more, but I wanted to make this video somewhat brief. And I hope you got some value from it. Uh, I do have a couple other videos coming your way. Uh, one of them is going to be the time on site video that, that, I, uh, that I alluded to. The other is I haven't done a gear video for a while, so I want to do a um, I'm going to do a video about lenses. So I have quite a menagerie of, of wide angle lenses for 
real that I use for real estate photography and real estate video that I'm going to, you know, get the whole collection, you know, here on the on the table and we'll just talk about them, you know, and I'll show some examples of, of what come, you know, what came from what lens and and whatnot. So anyway, as always, uh, go ahead and leave a comment if, uh, you know, if you have a, an idea about a topic or if you have something, you know, useful to uh, to say about this conversation. I really enjoy that real estate photography is a pretty close knit community and a lot of us know uh, one another. And, and so it's, it's really useful to have you engage like that. So anyway, uh, take care. I'll see you again soon.